Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Liza Gentile, and I'm a proud JWU alumna and the Assistant Director of Alumni Relations here at Johnson & Wales University. Before we get started, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items. We will be showing clips of the documentary during the program. If you're having trouble hearing them, please make sure your com computer volume is turned all the way up. The program will be viewed best in full screen mode, so you can see the, pre the presentation and the speaker simultaneously. If you have questions for our presenter, please add them to the Q&A section. They will be answered at the conclusion of the program. The chat feature can also be used to message other attendees privately or publicly. Now, I'd like to introduce Maureen Dumas, Vice President of Advancement and University Relations to get us started today. Thank you, Liza. Welcome to all of our alumni and a very special welcome to our Mary and Gertrude Society members. The Mary and Gertrude Society was recently established in the names of our founding mothers, Gertrude Johnson and Mary T. Wales. As we'll hear shortly, Ms. Johnson and Ms. Wales had the courage and vision to create Johnson & Wales University in 1914. More than a century later, we are proud to honor them by recognizing all of you, our loyal donors. The generosity of these alumni, parents, faculty and staff and friends who give each and every year helps provide the stability and flexibility needed to give rise to a new era of innovation and ambitious advancements in academics at Johnson & Wales. Thank you to all of you. I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Marion Gagnon, professor in the John Hazenwhite College of Arts and Sciences at Johnson & Wales University. Professor Gagnon has been making documentaries since 2004. She founded Goodnight Irene Productions, an indie documentary film company in honor of her mother, Irene. Her background and 15 years of experience as an award-winning journalist has paved the way for her avocation as a writer, director, and producer of documentaries. Gagnon is a full-time professor teaching film studies, journalism, visual literacy and sociology of perception, speech communications, and many more. She has a 30-year career at Johnson & Wales, a first decade, decade serving as Director of Communications and the last 20 years as a full-time faculty member. Marion holds a BA in Journalism, a Master's Degree in Teaching from Johnson & Wales, and a PhD in Interdisciplinary Studies with a focus on media studies and the documentary genre. Four of her films continue to be aired on Rhode Island PBS, and two, I'm so proud to say, have been nominated for the prestigious New England Emmy Award. The most recent being American, America's Forgotten Heroine, Ida Lewis, Keeper of the Light. Please join me in welcoming my friend, Dr. Marion Gagnon. Thank you, Maureen and Liza. I'm so thrilled to be here and talking about Gertrude and Mary. Um, my real passion once I began filmmaking was lost uh, and forgotten women's stories. And this was my first because as it says here, uh, this story really was on the cusp of being lost forever. And the reason that was, was because um, I, in this documentary, you'll see that I interviewed four or five uh, students who were actually in the classroom with Gertrude and Mary. And I thought it was really important to find people who sat in the classroom, had them as teachers, went to Johnson and Wales, obviously not 1914, but uh, certainly in the 30s and 40s. And these women were all in their 70s and 80s. And this was uh, 14 years ago, 17 years ago. So if uh, I had waited another 20 years, if Johnson and Wales had waited another 20 years, this history, that part of the history would have been lost for sure. So let me begin. Um, got a little PowerPoint here, and I also, um, <laughs> it was working a minute ago. Let's just see here. That is really strange. It stopped sharing. Let's see. Um, let me just do it manually this way. Okay. All right. Great. So yes, they truly had humble beginnings. And um, these are pictures of the very young and uh, Gertrude and Mary. And let me just 
explain about how this story came to be and how difficult it really was to make this documentary. Johnson Wales has always been very forward thinking and progressive and always looking to move fast and into the future. And we really haven't been that very good at looking at the past or trying to archive the past or to preserve the past. And a lot of uh, uh, Dr. Yenna and uh, Dr. Bowen would uh, would have agreed, de definitely agreed to that, agreed that that was one of our weaknesses. So about 17 years ago, when I was in the midst of making uh, my, working on my dissertation for my PhD, simultaneous to that, John Bowen, who was then the president of the Providence campus, suggested that uh, we do some kind of film to, to mark the 10th year anniversary of the library, the new library. And so somebody said, oh, Marion's working on a PhD in media studies in the documentary genre. So he called me in and I suggested instead of doing that, that we start at the beginning and that we really try to document Gertrude and Mary's story because we knew nothing about it other than that they started the school in 1914 with one student and one typewriter in, Mary, in uh, Gertrude's home on the east side of Providence. That was really the only narrative that we had. So John Bowen agreed that was a good idea. He asked me to put a proposal and a budget together and I did so and he green lighted the project. And that's how it began. So there were so few uh, archives that I had really nothing to work with other than um, uh, there was a painting in the library of Gertrude and Mary that was taken from just move this down a little, um, from a group graduation shot. And here's Mary Wales right here. So this little picture that's no bigger than a dime was what was used for the portrait in the library, which is still there today. And, and this graduation picture, you can see it's the same background. Mary graduated first, two years later, Gertrude get, uh, graduated. And they took this picture to also do that one painting, that portrait in the library. That was it. And I remember when I first got hired 30 years ago as director of communications, going to the library and looking at these, the picture of these two women and thinking, my God, I had no idea this university was started by two women and I was just so enthralled with that history and wondering, how did they do it? What, uh, you know, what obstacles were in their way? And as little did I know that 20 some odd years later, I'd be writing, directing and producing a documentary addressing that very issue. Okay, so this first clip that I'm going to show you is right after the introduction and it really talks about how these two women met and um, you'll see that it was at Millersville University in Pennsylvania. They were 17 and 19 when they went to school and it was at a normal school which was really a teaching prep school. So I obviously, with my videographer, Jim Karpacek, went to Millersville to uh, not only tour the school, meet a historian who was writing about the history of their university, but they also had archives that I could then uh, fig, uh, use and utilize for this documentary. So let's watch this and then we'll move on after that. Everyone who knew them described them exactly the same way. Oops. Gertrude Irene Johnson was the formidable one, a blustery, robust woman with a stern demeanor, the disciplinarian. Despite their different personas, they were two of a kind. They were highly principled, proper ladies, humble and very private, but they were also strong and willful, true visionaries, and they supported one another in every way. Well, these two relied on each other. Absolutely. And one never did anything without asking the opinion of the other. They got along very well, very well. They were nice to each other, never a harsh word and conducted themselves in a very business-like way. Miss Johnson 
strength was in her ability to just get things done and get them done right. She had a, an uncanny way of doing new things and she wasn't afraid to try new things. Miss Will was sort of a, a calming influence. She was a very quiet lady and spoke very softly, never raised her voice. She was very frail and quiet, but I noticed with Miss Wales being so quiet, everyone said, you know, she gets bossed around. Well, she didn't under that little silk sleeve with her, an arm of iron. They were perfectionists for one thing. You know, you did your homework and you it did get checked and you did, you did, you did your work. It was just uh, sort of a matter most of the grandstand, but always with elegance, you know, always consideration and elegance. But who were these two formidable women who planted a taproot in Providence in 1914 and sowed the seeds to what would later become an internationally recognized career university? Okay, so um, you'll notice that uh, the early part of the film showed the two women um, obviously actresses. So what I ended up doing was before we got to Millersville, I called the uh, communications director there and they had a theater program and I asked if we could do some type of recreate, uh, recreation because obviously we had, they had archives, John Soros had virtually no archives, but um, I needed more visuals to work with. So we, I sent pictures over of Gertrude and Mary, and they picked two women actresses, theater majors, and then they found the period clothes in the theater department with their props and costumes were. And this is how we shot this recreation of the two of them walking on campus, and the campus looked very much the same. It's an absolutely beautiful campus. We went in the spring when the flowers were in bloom. And then we transposed that into like the sepia tones that you see even here, which was more in that era of, um, of filmmaking, just to make it look more authentic. Um, I also interviewed four Johnson & Wales students that had, as I mentioned, sat in their classroom. And so how did I find them? I actually wrote to or called, I should say, a columnist at the Providence Journal and said, look, I'm working on this film. Can you put this in your column? I'm looking for any students that actually had um, Miss Johnson, Miss Wales as their students. And he did do that. And then my phone started to ring. I was thrilled. And I selected four students. You saw one of them who was talking about shorthand and what a perfectionist uh, they were uh, as teachers and how they she brought that that work ethic into her own career as a secretary. And the other person you saw was Vilma Triangulo. And she was not only a student of Miss Johnson and Miss Wales, but when she graduated, she got two job offers and she asked Gertrude and Mary, which job should I take? And they said, neither one, you're gonna work for us. And so she did. So she knew them, she said they were like, she was like the daughter that they never had. Um, and she, they really took her under their wing. And in the future, when they were ready to retire in the 40s, after Mary Wales got sick, um, they asked Vilma, do you think your husband would be interested in buying the school? So this was after World War II in the 40s, and Vilma thought, I don't think so. What does he know about education? And then she brought it up to him. That was Mr. Triangulo. And he said, absolutely. And she was like, what, what do you know about en education? And he said, I'm an engineer. Engineers can do anything. So he contacted his Navy buddy, Morris Gaby. And then the two of them, with the help of their funds from their mother's in law, uh, bought the school from Gertrude and Mary. And that's the second documentary that's in the trilogy. All right, so let's move on. So here's some shots from the actual shooting at Millersville. You could see how beautiful that campus is. And so we had, as I mentioned, the period clothing and um, a woman who looked, a young woman who looked very much like Mary, another one who looked like Gertrude. So they were, they met when they were in school together and they were friends, but they, uh, 
parted ways after they graduated and a second clip of the documentary is going to mention that. And this is me, um, younger obviously with long hair, directing and talking to the two actresses. And this is Jim Karpajek of Ocean State Video who did the shooting and the editing. He's an excellent uh, long time uh, videographer who actually worked for NBC 10 for years before he started his own business. Right, so here's some wonderful archives from Millersville. And you can see the school, and a, a lot of those buildings are still there. And luckily, we were able to shoot them and take digitals of them. And, uh, you know, a documentary is nothing without visuals, right? You can't just have somebody talking all of the time. So we're a very visual society. So lucky for me, Millersville was excellent keeping their own personal history. Let me see if there's a clip that goes with this that will talk about what it was like for the women. So they were there in the, uh, you know, the late 1800s, and this is what their lives were like as college students. Two women met while attending the first Pennsylvania State Normal School at Millersville. Mary was 19, Gertrude only 17. The curriculum here was geared almost exclusively towards normal education or teacher preparation. So the majority of the population would have been female. Most would have been in their late teens, their early 20s, and they would have spent two years here. They would generally spend their mornings in academic subject classes. Their afternoons would be spent in what we called the model department or the model school. That was where they actually gained experience teaching. And under the supervision of faculty, they would learn the ropes of the classroom. Their day began about 6.30 in the morning with the sounding of a bell. And it ended sometime shortly after 9 o'clock at night with the sounding of a bell. And throughout the day, there was the tolling of the bell to tell the students when it was time to move to some other activity. At the other end of campus from here, that bell still rings each day as a kind of symbolic recognition at that time. Still in the clutches of the Victorian era, women were carefully guarded at Millersville and expected to be proper ladies at all times. Social activities were religiously based. There was the Women's Christian Temperance Union, a Bible study club, and two literary societies to choose from. Socially, this was a, a very conservative institution, and there were very firm and fixed rules about student conduct, and particularly about what they called the association between the sexes. It was not permitted for a male and female student or teacher student to have a conversation outside the classroom. Students found very imaginative ways around those rules, uh, much to the consternation of the faculty. Just two blocks from where we're sitting is a road called Shanks Lane, which is really only a half block off what was on campus. And students would oftentimes um, uh, make arrangements, usually through this practice called snapping. Uh, and since men, male and female students could not talk outside the classroom, could not talk to each other outside the classroom, uh, they would snap their fingers, and that was an indication to meet at the foot of Shanks Lane. Today, uh, the phrase snapping in our student newspaper, the snapper, are a reminder of that, though most folks have no memory of it. Mary was the first to graduate from Millersville. It was 1893, and the local paper reports that she sang a solo at her commencement. Her senior thesis, written in perfect Palmer penmanship, reveals a single pragmatic statement that would one day become their school's mission, the very mission of Johnson and Wales University today. We should teach a thing not for its own sake, but as a preparation for what lies beyond. When Gertrude graduated two years later in 1895, their paths separated for two decades. Gertrude returned to Norristown to teach and later to work as an examiner for a bank. This would prove to be a far-reaching decision. 
for it was here that she learned the importance of practical career training. Mary became a teacher in Newton, Pennsylvania and fell in love. She was engaged, but her fiance was killed in the Spanish-American War. Later, she moved to Montague, Massachusetts. There, she taught first, second, and third graders for more than a decade. Mary's annual teacher salary was $400, considerably less than what the janitor earned. Destiny brought the two women back together in 1913 when they both accepted jobs as teachers at Rhode Island Commercial School, later to become Bryant College. Okay, so um, some of these more recent archives are from Rhode Island Historical Society. So I went there to look at images and here's the original, what's now Bryant University, uh, the commercial school started by this Mr. Bryant and that's where Gertrude and Mary reconnected 20 years after they left Millersville University and went their separate ways. Um, that other picture that you saw where Mary had taught at Montague, a small school in Massachusetts, where she's sitting with her students, uh, I called that school just to see if they had any archives. And they said, well, lucky for you, uh, there is a woman in the community who works on her, on her kitchen table that's trying to chronicle all the teachers that have ever, ever worked at our school. So I called her and she, at first, the first look, she said, no, I'm so sorry, I, I don't have anything about Mary Wales. I was really disappointed. And then about a week later, I got a phone call and it was like, Eureka, she had found this picture. And sure enough on the back, it was identified as uh, Mary T. Wales. And there she was with her students. And a lot of them, you probably noticed, weren't even wearing shoes. And it was a striking reminder of how little women made as teachers back then. As I pointed out, she'd made $400 a year, which was a lot less than the janitor made. So it puts things in perspective as to how difficult it was for women to be career women, first of all, and to be teachers and to really make their way into the world and to be uh, recognized and paid the value that they um, that they deserved. So yes, there's that picture. So you'll see it's a little, you know, um, out of focus or it's because it's a very old picture was starting to disintegrate, but there she is with her students in her own little cinched uh, corseted clothes and um, with her students, as I point out, many of whom did not wear any uh, shoes. So it shows the, the poverty too. And it's a picture of the original uh, Bryant College. That building's not there anymore. So what's interesting is what the next, this next part of the clip of the documentary shows about how the women got the idea to break away and start their own school. So I'll let the, the documentary tell the story here. Big business school run by Mr. Jacobs and they worked for him and I guess, now this had to be before 1914 and I guess they figured, uh, I can hear, you know, Ms. Johnson saying, look, we're working for him. Why can't we work for ourselves? And so they did. In 1914, one year later, the women set up shop in Miss Johnson's home at 250 Hope Street. With one student and one typewriter, the Johnson and Wales Business School was born. And I'll never forget one afternoon, Mr. Jacobs, the owner of the big commercial school, came in and he said, well, ladies, he said, I thought I'd pay a call and see what my competition is doing. And uh, he looked around and he said, very nice, but I guess I won't have to worry. He said, in fact, I'll even send you some students, you know. And uh, Miss Johnson didn't think that was funny at all. So that's how it all began. And I can't tell you what a thrill it was to go to that house where Gertrude lived and where Gertrude and Mary started the school with one student and one typewriter and I, it was a real estate office in that first floor when I went there and um, it really thrilled me to the bone when I walked in my hair kind of stood up on my arms because I thought god this is where 
young Gertrude and young Mary started it all, never imagining the success they'd have and the gumption that it took for them to break away to women and to start this, this school. And basically they were doing it for women to get them out of the factories, get them out of domestic work and to help them have a better life by going into the professions as opposed to the life sucking work that uh, factories uh, produced. So this other clip talks about how Gertrude and Mary were doing this during what was called the new woman era. And I had to really educate myself about this new woman era. I had remember learning a little about it when I had taken a women's studies course when I was an undergrad and women's studies was like a brand new major. And I dabbled in one or two courses. In fact, I, for this documentary, I went back to URI and found, my, found one of my former professors who wrote about working women, wrote a book about working women, and knew all about the new woman era and was thrilled to talk about what Gertrude and Mary were going through at the time. So this is um, a clip that really talks about this era that um, they lived in and really took advantage of, gave them the strength to do what they wanted to do. Gertrude and Mary were part of the new woman era. This new woman was mobile, independent, self-confident, and often rejected marriage in exchange for a career. Many women who receive education at this point in time feel a kind of mission as women not to waste their education. And Ms. Johnson and Ms. Wales fit that profile. They show us that by what they did later, that they pursued this uh, business education with a real dedication and with a, with a sense of mission as women that they wanted to do something important with their education. The relationship between the two women is obviously central to their success in, in creating this school. They must have respected each other, liked each other, been tolerant of each other's foibles. One was strong where the other wasn't and vice versa. It's a, a common aspect of the um, new womanhood, to have these strong, strong female friendships. Exactly. For them to have the strong female friendship, to be able to move away, live together, uh, not be suspect, and very focused on being teachers. And at that time, if a woman were to get married, she'd have to give up her career as a teacher. It was uh, not acceptable to do both. And that um, professor was, professor was talking about Sharon Strong from URI, who's now retired, but who's an expert in the new woman era and working women at that time. So women's suffrage was in full, you know, uh, blown mode. And as uh, Sharon Strong points out, this was, in the headlines all of the time, women fighting for the right to vote. And so just imagine that Gertrude and Mary were reading about this, having very strong opinions, I'm sure about it. And it was going on all around them in Providence. And again, their goal was to help women become professionals and to get them into an office, a clean office environment and get them out of the, of the uh, as I say, the life-sucking mills that was just so difficult to work in and uh, where children, women, and men, of course, uh, all work there. Very, very difficult times. And you'll see this downtown picture. This is Providence, downtown Providence. Those of you who were at the Providence campus, this uh, was the little, this is still there that became a little police outpost for a while. Um, and uh, Johnson and Wales actually took the over this for a while about, I don't know, 15 or 20 years ago where you could go in and ask questions about Johnson and Wales. And right to the right of it is um, where the old, um, old um, stores used to be and the outlet store and things that burnt down and Johnson and Wales pretty much owns all of these, these two blocks now and that's where we built our central campus. So it's really cool to see those old images, again, that I got from the Rhode Island Historical Society. Okay, so um, 
there's another clip here that I'd like to share with you that um, will bring us more forward into the documentary and then um, I'll, I'll address it when after you've seen it. There's a lot going on in this period. It's a kind of bustling, very intense period from 1890 to the First World War. And these women would have been part of that movement from smaller towns to big cities. When they get to the city, they can live together. No one will question that. They can engage in this creation of a business, basically, and things that they wouldn't have been able to do in 1880. Women's suffrage is proceeding at a very rapid clip at this point, and there is a, a women's suffrage movement in Rhode Island. It would have been in the newspapers and the Providence Journal that they read every day, but they're they're seeing this all around them. They had to, had to be feminists. They walk into a man's world here with these two women, and you know, built a thriving business. And whatever they were doing, they were doing it right. Their students now in their seventies and eighties remember them as exceptional teachers with very high standards. So that's one of the students who went on to be a nun who I interviewed and you, when you watch the whole documentary and you'll get a link to that, it's only 27 minutes long, you'll meet um, this sister and she wanted to go into the nunhood and her parents were averse to that and they were like go to Johnson and Wales at least for two years and if you still want to be a nun after that you can and so she agreed and she did become a nun nonetheless and she goes on in a document documentary to say about how they were the best some of the best teachers she ever had and that when she went on to teach in South America and for the Peace Corps that she really fashioned herself after Gertrude Johnson so uh, then when World War II ended in 1945 and vets were coming back from the war, uh, the war uh, that was the first time that Gertrude and Mary decided maybe they'd let men in. So this is a clip that just talks about that. And it's um, quite, quite comical, actually. After World War II, men began attending the school in greater numbers. And while it changed the dynamic of the classroom, the rules for propriety never faltered. It was peculiar that she had the uh, initial, uh, she was Gertrude I. Johnson. So of course those days, uh, G.I. was a you know, common phrase. So she was referred to as G.I. Johnson. So uh, and like a top sergeant, they expected you to come to school every day, dressed for business, and have the manners appropriate for a business person. And no, no horsing around and uh, things like that. And uh, if you stepped out of line, um, Miss Johnson would confront you and she generally had a ruler in her hand. She would say, young man, I'm giving you one warning. And then the second time she would say, young man, I've warned you before you are discharged like that. And that was the end of it. And that was the end of it, gone, expelled from school. So they had very uh, high standards and uh, G.I. Johnson was definitely to be feared as uh, even as this, as this young man who later served on the Board of Trustees um, did talk about and recall. So these pictures, um, I'm trying to remember how I found them, I think, I had to reach out to people at Johnson Wales who might have a picture in their filing cabinet at the bottom of their drawer, but it was no central place. There is a central place now and it's in the library as a result of the documentary. But uh, so I did find this picture. Here's Gertrude with her card that she supposedly loved so much. And here's um, Ma Mary and Gertrude here in their home in Warwick where they retired and a picture with them sitting with, with some of their students. That's Gertrude with the hat and that's Mary. So obviously they're well into their uh, 60s and 70s at that point and Mary had gotten really sick. She, um, she was diagnosed with cancer and it was she still came to work every day and she wanted, um, they both decided that maybe it was time to, to sell the school and for them to uh, enjoy their last years um, retired. 
and they did. And this is how this ends. We know that Gertrude Johnson and Mary Wales took great pride in their role as teachers and dedicated themselves to helping young women learn employable skills. But they probably never realized that they were also building the very foundation for what would later become a fully accredited, internationally recognized career university with more than 15,000 students and multiple campuses across the United States. When people say Johnson and Wales, it's Miss Johnson and Miss Wales as far as I'm concerned. When I walk on Providence campus, I look around and I just feel sometimes they're around looking and gasping. I think that they would be very happy how it expanded on the morning. I think uh, if they were alive and younger today, they would be part of it. I think it's a compliment to them that the name wasn't changed. It could have been. So that's a compliment to the two women. To have made this partnership, which is both a personal partnership and a business relationship, and a sense of mission and education, hold that package together for so many decades, it's an extraordinarily admirable history. I know of no other alumni who started an institution of the stature of Johnson and Wales. So this was really, uh, for Millersville and Millersville alumni, quite a, uh, a singular accomplishment. Well, I think they might have looked at each other and said, we did it, we did it. They believed in each other, they believed in themselves. And they believed they could make it happen by God, they did. Okay, so that shows the conclusion. There's lots of wonderful anecdotal information throughout the documentary that we don't have time to show, but we wanted to make sure we left some time over for a Q&A. So at this point, I'd like to hand it over to Liza, who will then facilitate the question and answer session. Thanks, Marian. If anyone has any questions, you can type them right into the Q&A feature and we will get those answered for you. Uh, Marion, we do have one. Uh, I know it was said in the video, but can you repeat the name of the school in Millersville? It was actually called Millersville, I think it was college at the time, but it's Millersville University now, and it's in Millersville, Pennsylvania. Still there very much, um, a thriving school. And as that historian said, out of all their alumni that they've ever had, that uh, Gertrude, Johnson, and Mary Wales, that's probably the biggest, most singular accomplishment of all alumni, that these two, two graduates of theirs, that they're so proud of, actually started a university, or it was a college at the time, obviously. But um, so they recognize that these two women, their alumni are two of their grads that they are so incredibly proud of. Great. Are you aware of other colleges or universities that were founded by women, especially during this era? I think there, I'm, I'm trying to remember what my research showed. I don't know for sure. I think um, there might have been one or two, but it was not uh, a common thing at all. And again, this started as a business school, so as a secretarial school, and that might have been like the only way a woman could have started any kind of school back in that day. Uh, you know, women were just didn't have the education that men had. Luckily, Gertrude and Mary's parents both really believed in education for their daughters and sent them to college. That was a rare, rare thing. And as that historian pointed out, that was um, a teaching school. And it was something that uh, when people, when the women who attended there, they had to be completely dedicated to this if they were gonna go on and make this their career because they had to choose one or the other, a career or marriage. They couldn't have both at the time. So um, it really shows the kind of commitment that they had from the beginning. And what a thrill it was, I have to say, for me to actually hold the book in which Mary T. Wales' thesis 
was written in and her penmanship. Um, and there it was in broad, uh, plain text, beautiful Palmer penmanship, really the root of the mission of Johnson and Wales today, which was experiential learning to teach this thing, not for its own sake, but for what lies beyond the career university that we've been forever. So that's, that was how Millersville was. The two women brought that when they started Johnson and Wales, and that continues to be a really important backbone of Johnson and Wales. Great. Um, Topher would like to know, what was your biggest surprise on this journey that you were not expecting to find out? Oh, that's a really good question. I think I was surprised to see that there were still students alive and uh, happy and cogent and willing to be interviewed. So I was keeping my fingers crossed that that would be the case. And, um, and it was, and it really brought life to the documentary, I think. There, one woman that you didn't get to see talks about what incredible teachers they were. And before she ends the on-camera interview, she actually breaks down into tears and says, they were incredible role models. They were like mother, a mother to, to her. And I think the women were very nurturing and very caring. And there were some things that didn't get into the film, some anecdotal uh, information, like one of them said that uh, she, she was late getting out of class one day or something and missed the bus and it was getting dark. It was winter time and Gertrude and Mary came out, and locked up the building and they said, what are you still doing here? And she said, oh, well, I'm waiting for the bus. So they stayed with her and waited to make sure that she was safe in downtown Providence. So it was little things like that, which really uh, showed a lot about their character and their, their nurturing abilities. Um, there were other things too that really I found really heart rendering. Um, and at the moment, well, let's move on to the other question. If something pops up, I'll definitely jump in. Sure. So Kathy would like to know, were they still involved in the university when other programs started? No. Once they sold the school to uh, Mo Gaby and Ed Triangulo, they never looked back. They never meddled. They retired. They bought a house in Warwick at the Governor Francis Farm. Uh, and that, that was one of the first houses built there. And that's where they lived until Mary died. So remember, Mary had gotten really sick. She was diagnosed with cancer in their later years at Johnson & Wales. And what you'll see if you get to watch the whole documentary, and I hope you do, is that she never missed one day of work. Didn't matter how sick she was. And Vilma says she was suffering terribly. She would come to work every day with this is one of the things that surprised me with Gertrude into the end she'd stay in the office she wasn't teaching anymore and they put a screen up and there was a little couch back there and she would just lay down on the couch with a blanket on and just stay there the entire day until they were ready to close up the school at the end of the day and um Gertrude um and the two of them had the strongest work ethic you can ever imagine. And I don't think they wanted to do one thing without the other. They were just such a partnership and such a team. And as that young man said, you know, you had to come to school. No, Vilma said that. Whether you had a broken leg, there were no excuses. You had to come to school. And Mary really demonstrated that. And I think that was one of the things that really surprised me. Uh, Jonathan would like to know, in your research, did you ever come across any family of Miss Johnson and Miss Wales? No, and I looked too. Trust me, I wanted to find maybe, of course, of course they didn't have any children. Um, I was hoping to find like a niece or a nephew, but I wasn't able to do that. And I, I looked, you know, maybe with Ancestry.com now, I could have done it, but I didn't have that as, um, as an option back then. So no, I didn't. And here's an interesting little side thing. Um, as I said, there were so few archives. I was so happy that Millersville had some good pictures and every once in a while, somebody would find something in the back of a closet at Johnson & Wales or in a filing cabinet, or I got it at the Montague School. But during the premiere, when we premiered the film on campus, um, I invited everybody who had been part of the film to be part of it, of course. And of course, I invited the people who now own the house that Gertrude and Mary had retired in. 
and they had sold that house to this couple's parents and then the parents sold it to them. So I had, I had, had to ask for permission to shoot the exterior of that house for the film. And so I invited them to the premiere and at the little cocktail hour at the end, the, the woman who lived there now says, I have something I have to tell you. And I was like, what? And, she, and her husband was like, don't tell her, don't tell her, it's not gonna do any good. And I was like, tell me. And she said, when we moved in, when we bought the house for my parents, and my parents bought it from Gertrude and Mary, she said, we found a big box of pictures and memorabilia and all this stuff from Johnson and Wales. She said, we brought it to the dump. And that just broke my heart because I thought, oh my God, she said, if only I had given it to the school. She didn't even think to do that. So that was like a little treasure trove that ended up at the Providence dump, which was heartbreaking because we had so few archives to work with. Um, we have another question. After classes were held in Gertrude's home, where were the school and classes moved to? Did they have to buy or rent a space? Yeah, they moved to a bigger apartment for the second one on Onlysville, Only Street, and that's in the documentary. And you'll see a picture of the exterior. And then they moved, they rented a small space, and then they ended up at the Gardner Building, which is there today. They're on the top floor, and it's right across from the Providence Journal. And um, that was their last, I think their last 20 or 30 years that, that they taught that they were there. And um, as I say, they had the whole top floor and when they relinquished the school, there were a hundred students. They had a hundred students. Okay. Um, Elizabeth would like to know what your favorite part of the story is. Um, I think my favorite part is just getting it down and getting it right. Um, I'm you know, a former newspaper reporter, so accuracy is really important. And as I said, my passion is lost to forgotten women's stories. And I just knew, I always knew that this must be an incredible story. So as I started to dig and put the story together and put all the pieces of the puzzle together, I would put the pictures up next to my computer of Gertrude and Mary, and I would like talk to them and say, am I getting this right? I hope I'm getting this right. Because it was so important that not only I got to tell their story, which was nobody really knew, but that I got it right. So I think the overall process, and it was a good year in the making while I was teaching and finishing my PhD, um, it was such a special project for me. I think it's one of the things that I'm like most proud of um, at Johnson & Wales, even though I, you know, I've been there for 30 years and I've certainly done a lot of work and developed curriculum and I love teaching and I love to be in director of communications. But this documentary even, and it's just the first of a trilogy, is one of my proudest accomplishments because it tells a story that really is my contribution to not only Rhode Johnson Wales history, but Rhode Island history and to women's history. Are you currently working on a documentary project or do you have an idea of what you would like to do next? That's a great question. I've been working uh, furiously teaching. So I've, since that documentary, um, after it came out and we had the premiere, the men decided they wanted this story. So the second part was the Gaby Triangulo years. And then after that, it was the Yenna legacy and how the, the whole building of the campus downtown province. So that became a trilogy. And then after that, I went back, I got back to doing my passionate uh, work which which was lost or forgotten women's stories and I did a documentary about Ida Lewis, uh, Maureen Dumas mentioned that, uh, the most famous lighthouse keeper in the whole world who was right in Newport and she was the most famous because she rescued all of these people. She was 105 pounds and she saved upwards of 30 people when she was uh, the lighthouse keeper there and starting again like at age 17. So um, that documentary took like five years to make because I was uh, very busy teaching and raising my daughter. And um, so that was my last project. I'm going to be retiring uh, next year and I hope to get back into filmmaking full time. So yes, I have some ideas. I keep a little file on my computer um, and every once in a while I'll get something from a friend who says, oh, this sounds like your kind of story. And it's usually about some incredible woman who's done some 
thing that most people don't know about. So stay tuned. Thanks, Marian. Uh, we have one more question I'd like to ask Maureen um, to come back because I think she'll be able to assist in answering this one as well. Uh, the question is, is there a scholarship or anything that honors Miss Johnson and Miss Wales on an annual basis by Johnson and Wales at present date? When I attended in 1994, I had never heard this story. It makes me very proud to know this is a part of my academic legacy. Oh, thank you for that question. Um, I can tell you as of today, we do not have a scholarship in their names, but um, the reason we started the Mary and Gertrude Society was to honor them. And we felt there was a team of us who really looked at how we would create this society. And we felt the best way to honor our two founders was to elevate the individuals who have consistently supported the university. So the donations that we receive from the donors in the Mary and Gertrude Society goes immediately to help our students. Um, so from our perspective, it was a terrific way to honor them in that it's an immediate need specifically for students and we felt that that's what they would like to see. So I guess I'm gonna go right into the closing. Um, I, I just have to clap because that was just amazing. I have seen this uh, before, but to hear the background and your research was just really fascinating. So thank you, Dr. Gagnon. Uh, it reminds us all of our humble beginnings and the exponential growth of Johnson & Wales and really, which is a relatively short period of time. Um, as she said, her story is the first of a three-part series about the history of Johnson Wales, so be on the lookout. We're going to be offering future programming. I've been with Johnson Wales for over 27 years, and the university continues to grow and move boldly into the future. The John Hayes and White College of Arts and Sciences is an important part of this evolution and provides a true cross-disciplinary education that opens the doors to a variety of careers for our students. Like so many other colleges and universities, JWU has also experienced uncertainties and difficult decisions during the pandemic and throughout our history. Through every success and with every challenge, we at Johnson & Wales University have rallied together and displayed incredible strength, flexibility, and resilience. Today, I invite all of you to invest in our future and the next generation of Wildcats with the gift of any amount directly to the John Hayes and White College of Arts and Sciences. We shared a donation link in the chat window for your convenience. Your gifts will be used to immediately help students. Donor support is important more than ever and together we can truly make a difference. I sincerely hope that you've enjoyed today's session, The Making of Her Story, Jay Wu's Founding Mothers. It's amazing to see our growth since these two women opened the university, which has led to a major university with seven colleges as of today. Her story is part of the JWU Connects family of programming. Through JWU Connects, alumni can engage in informative and interesting discussions related to professional development topics, as well as opportunities for networking with fellow classmates. For a full listing of these events, please visit our, visit our alumni site at alumni.jwu.edu. Please join me in thanking Dr. Gagnon for her presentation today. We appreciate your attendance and have a wonderful day. Thank you. It was an honor.